later. You were saying? Oh, right. So earlier you were talking about detachment, and I was wondering what you thought of the quote, detachment is the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that to me? Yeah. Because I was thinking about that quote a lot when I was reading the Buddha and Dharma Said by Siddhartha the Buddha. He's right. But that saying of the Buddha is only true for the Buddha. Consider for a moment that I say to you that education is awful. You should never, ever, ever put that in your pocket and walk around with it. And I'll tell you why. You're 18. I am 58. I'm 20. Fine. <laughs> I am 58 and you're 20. I have a bachelor's. I have two masters. I have a PhD. I've written books. I've given lectures. I've been in this classroom, in classrooms, for about 30 years. I am rich with experience. My life is slowly coming to an end. And as you get older, you begin to examine what you have done in life. And if you're honest, you come to realize you haven't done much with it. And then you ask, why have I been wasting my time going to school, talking, writing, reading, why? So yes, for me, when I look back, it doesn't mean I haven't been happy, or I haven't been successful, or haven't made my kids and my wife and my parents proud. It's been a good life, but it has lost its luster. You are beginning your life. You need to be frightened just in case you don't get your degrees. This is not a society that's gonna hand out money give you rent-free environment. If you make the wrong choices in your life, you will be crushed. And you won't be able to therapize anyone because you'll be in therapy yourself. So the saying of the Buddha that life is suffering and suffering is caused by attachment is very true, not for you. You need to be attached to fear. That fear will push you to stay in school, to pass your classes, to get a degree. Now, when you have a master's degree and you say, this is garbage, fine. Now you can say something is bad because you have it. You've examined it. You've come to realize it's a value, and for you, it doesn't exist. Now walk away. You know, it's not difficult for someone who is lonely and miserable to say relationships are bad. Be in a relationship, understand it well, and then walk away. Because then your loneliness can have meaning and profundity. It's housed in richness of understanding. It's like, because um, when the Buddha was born, I heard that he was born in a palace with all the luxuries in the world and he wasn't allowed to leave the palace. And then when he left the palace, he, uh, he starved himself and he found out that that wasn't viable either. So then eventually he ate and he meditated and he reached him. Really? you just given me like a, the life of the sage in like less than a minute. How's that even possible? for you to, to do such injustice to the life of a man who has over a billion following? I mean, I understand, I know. It's a watered down culture. Let me, can I maybe say a few things about his life? Mm -hmm. Explain it better than I just did. Oh, absolutely. I don't really mind if some of you find me arrogant, it's okay. I reserve my humility for my craft, not for people.
His name is Siddhartha initially. And in Sanskrit, Siddhartha means someone who pursues the desires of the flesh. Who in this room doesn't do that? Symbolically, metaphorically, Leila, you have a different name. It's called Siddhartha, gender neutral. You pursue the desires of your body. In fact, if I was to go a bit further, which is places I shouldn't go just yet, most of the bad feelings you have have to do with how you have been treated by physical human beings. A boyfriend being harsh with you, a father rejecting you, an instructor giving you an F, these all belong to your body and all the insecurities that your body and mind will have. And remember your mind is nothing but the creation of physical society. From the age zero to ultimately the time you die, you're just going to pursue the stuff to keep your body and your mind secure, far from damage, hurt, suffering, misery. You have to spend a few lifetimes to overcome the siddhartic part of you. But there is also this other part of you which is called the Buddha. The part that has the potential to become awakened, to be mindful, to be aware, to be decent, to be compassionate. But that lives under an, under an avalanche of garbage. Imagine that you're one of those people who rarely cleans the room, your room. And for some strange reason, you wake up on a cold winter day and you say, I am looking for that jacket of mine. You look at your room, it's a mess. So where is that? And you know, you're gonna spend the next two weeks cleaning your room looking for that jacket. Now imagine one day you wake up and you say, my life is cold, it's meaningless, it lacks value. There are moments of inspiration. I've experienced them. I've felt them. I've been moved by them. I've written poetry about them. I've spoken to people and they too have been touched by my inspiration. I'm looking for that. But to get there, to find it, you have to get rid of all the things, that, all the junk you have in your mind and the world of emotions. Now for that desire to come to the surface, Leila, it has to be profound, intense, potent. You can't forget it. Let me give you a really, really bad example. And forgive me for uh, using this example, but I think it's, I don't have any other thing right now in my mind. Imagine you come from a culture where you don't speak to men. You're not going to allow any man to touch you. Virginity has profound importance in your culture. You just go to a shop to grab yourself a cup of coffee. You run into a young man. You don't know why, you don't know how, but something about you says, I feel so connected and I don't know why. And eventually, you know, time passes and you go to him and he says hello, you say hello. Before you know it, you guys are being intimate and you miss your period and then you realize you're pregnant. Now you can't shame your culture, you can't shame yourself, your parents, your reputation, your name. In those cultures, your name has so much value, you lose that you have nothing. Something inside you is growing. Now, you're pregnant. What do you do? 
It's not like you can just go to bed and close your eyes and forget the whole thing. It doesn't work that way. The desire to become mindful, to become decent, to become a human being, it has to be like that. But there is also a footnote you need to be aware of, which is it needs to come to a place where abortion is not a possibility anymore. You can't go back. <clears throat> what you're saying about the Buddha is true. But I think most often people miss the most important components, and I'll tell you why they miss it. Because they don't come from a culture that is ethical. They don't understand the human journey. They don't understand what people need to go through to get to the place of becoming the Buddha. Do you know how to make rice? Tell me, how do you make rice? Put rice in a pot, put your finger in, and you fill the water up. Let me tell you how I make rice, can I? Put about three cups of water, maybe four, in a pot. Put it on the stove, high temperature. Add some salt. You should take notes. Rachel, Rebecca, take notes. Add some salt and olive oil. Let it come to a boil, okay? About two cups of rice. Wash it first to get the starch out a little. Let it sit there. And as the rice sits in water, it expands. So you want to put the rice in water and let it sit there for about half hour to 45 minutes. <clears throat> and then you'll see no water because all the water has been absorbed by each grain, each rice, single rice, okay? Once the water comes to a boil, put the rice in there. Let it kind of boil for about five minutes. Then strain it. Wash the pot, grab a couple of potatoes, skin them, or maybe not. Wash them really well though. Cut them maybe half an inch thick. Put some olive oil, temperature high. Let the oil come to sizzle. Then lower the temperature. Put the potatoes underneath at the bottom with some salt on the top. Then put the rice there on top of the potatoes. Add some water and some butter. Put a towel on the lid, then put the lid on top. Low temperature, about two hours. It's like paradise. Now, do you know why I can tell it to you in that way? It's not me, I assure you. I live in a culture where you are forced to see those things on a daily basis. In your home, in your aunt's home, in your uncle's home, in the mosques, on the streets. It becomes part of who and what you are. That's what it means to understand something really, really, really well. The other thing you need to understand about Siddhartha is the following. You're talking about India, almost 3,000 years ago. Do you know how traditional cultural people live? They're not individuals. They are bound by tradition. You don't walk away from your parents. You don't turn your back to religion. You don't become an outcast because then you can't survive. It's not like here, man, where you can like leave your parents, go to In-N-Out, make 20 bucks an hour, have a car, have a studio, and live your life, and never see or call your parents. It doesn't work that way. If you don't say hello to your parents, a good smacking is coming your way. If you disrespect your neighbor, they'll kick you, they'll hit you. They won't care who your parents are. 
you're talking about communal environments where you belong to this umbilical cord and you can't cut it off. You also forget something very, very, very important about Siddhartha, which is this. What do you think your father, your mother has done, have done for you? They have given you a castle. They've tried their best to make sure no harm comes to you. Why do you think Polo asked this question? Should I send my kids to public education? She's trying to build them a castle. So instructors like me don't damage their kids. They're not sent home with stupid busy work. Every single father, every single mother tries to create a castle for their kids, protect them from harm's way. A parent's job isn't to create intellectual kids. Make sure they got clothes on their back, food in their belly, a roof over their head, because life is tough. What, you wanna go to your dad and say, do you love me? Can you tell me what love is? No, you don't ask these questions. What can your father say? So you know, it doesn't take a regular, normal, mediocre human being to walk away from all of that. You have to be troubled, and you have to be troubled in the right way. How many times, how often have you seen sick people? You see them on a daily basis. Have they moved you? Of course not. You see them as just being sick. But you have to internalize that experience, which means that you see me right now, right? Layla? Yes. I am 58. You know what that means? There was a time I used to be 20, you know? I used to play tennis eight hours a day. I wanted to be a tennis pro. I wanted to be the next Cristiano Ronaldo. I wanted to be a musician. Blink of an eye, Layla. I became 58. Internalize that. Put yourself in my shoes for a moment. Adopt my perspective. Education sucks the way it's being given to people. All your pursuits in life will eventually become devoid of meaning. Internalize it. Feel it. Become pregnant with it. See, you can't do that. It's impossible. Right now, you're just hearing sounds. And you're going to be engaged in selective hearing. You'll hear the things you like to, you'll dismiss the things you don't. And let's just say you're really, really hearing things. How long do you think they're gonna stay with you? 10 minutes, an hour, maybe a day, maybe a week, and then what? What are you gonna do with all the troubles given to you by these ideas and internalizations? They're gonna make you miserable. So you know what you'll do? You'll slowly forget. So next time someone asks you about Buddhism, you're not talking about an ordinary human being. It's a super extraordinary human being. 3,000 years ago, today walking away from parents, no big deal. 3,000 years ago, people would have crucified you. How many times have you seen dead people? Even on TV. See, we have all these experiences the Buddha has. We are no different. There is only one difference. He takes those, internalizes them, lives with them. He won't forget them. You know, my father-in-law had stage four cancer before he passed. So, and he was a very quiet man. He wouldn't really say much about his difficulties before or after the sickness. There came a point where he just refused medical assistance. Near the end, he just accepted the fact that he was going to die. And at that point, he found peace, relatively speaking. You need to have cancer for ideas. 
But it doesn't matter where you go, it doesn't matter what you do, you just can't forget. But the problem with living such a life is that <clears throat> we're not designed for that. Our bodies, our mechanism is designed to forget, especially experiences that are painful. Why do you think people go to therapy at the age of 40 or 50 or 60? Because they pushed things down at the age of five or 10 or 15. And they think that just because they forget, it's not gonna impact them. But the problem with traumatic experiences is that they have a tendency of leaking. You know, it's like I made the shed this past uh, break And I realized that the roof leaks a little because it wasn't slanted very much. And here's the thing you need to know about water. If the roof is not sealed properly, water will eventually get in. And once it finds itself in, the hole will get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you have dry rods. And then an entire section maybe even the entire house, if we just don't pay any attention to it, will have to be demolished. People go to therapy at the age of 50 or 60 because their entire life has been turned upside down. They can no longer keep the leakages. It's everywhere now. To become the Buddha, you have to be profoundly honest. It's not something we like to do. It's too painful. I mean, look at the love relationships we get ourselves into. Any other questions? Really? I have said all these awful things. And none of you have anything to say. How is that even possible? David? Yeah. You said something about uh, Oakland not having much respect for its citizens. What would it look like for a city to have respect? The what? what? What does it look like for a city to have respect? I actually don't know. Um, You know, there have been countless books, countless ideas, countless philosophers and sages who have talked about an ideal city. It is such a complex idea, and I'll tell you why. I'll give you a very, very brief example. Let's say you walk into this class and you raise your hand and you say, can we talk about how the grading system in this class works? Now, let's just say you're 18. The truth is, David, that question for you is very important as it ought to be, because your future depends on passing this class. I need to respect it. I need to answer your question in a very clear way. And that's how I treat you with respect. That's what they call justice. You ask a question, it's important to you, I must nourish you in a way that's satisfactory for you. But here's the difficulty that I have with the question. The question serves me injustice. Because I don't really care about grades. Your A is not going to save you. Life is suffering is not exempt to you because you graduated from Yale. It's not gonna protect your marriage. It's not gonna make you a better parent. It doesn't mean you're not gonna seek therapy down the line. It doesn't mean you won't be a drunk or an addict to porn or drugs or alcohol. You just have an A. You want an A? It's very simple. Pay attention to the conversations we have. 
You want an A? Go home and think about the stuff we talk about. Then sit down patiently and write. But you can't write without thinking. And if you want your writing to be good, your thinking needs to have depth. And if your thinking needs to have depth, you need to go to places where you haven't gone before. But you don't want to do that. Right? You want to go to Canvas on Saturday, go through three hours of work, and then sit down for about 10 minutes and write an essay. And then you want a passing grade like an A or a B. A C is way beneath you. The difficulty is not you and the difficulty is in me. The truth is, we stand at different positions in life. I am near the end, you're just beginning. I see things you can't see. And I'm not gonna turn my face on the other side to not see what I see and not know what I know. And I'm going to share with you my experiences. They may be wrong, I don't really care. They may be troubling for you, that I don't even care either. It's a philosophy class. It's there to make you think. You may ask a very simple question, but the truth is human beings are immensely complicated, especially where they live in an environment, such an environment that is even more complex. You know, let's say you want to give all the homeless people a tiny house. Right? Well, the problem with homelessness, if you've been in the streets, on the streets for too long, is that your self-esteem goes out the window. Well, what do you do with that? And you know what happens when you don't have self-esteem? You're shown a good amount of disrespect by society. You have anger issues. And if you've been in the streets for a while, you also have Addic addiction issues. Okay, so I've given you a home. Now it becomes a hub for weed or crack or porn. It's not enough. You can't just give people a home and say, go there and live. The hell do you do with all these other personality disorders? You know, I teach a social and political philosophy class. I don't know how a just system looks like. You know, I don't know, I mean, there are only 20 people in this room. You know, some of you just here for a grade. You don't care for the conversation. You can't really blame you or force you. Some of you perhaps don't like people like me from the Middle East. Well, I can't change that in 10 minutes. Some of you have had traumatic experiences in life. So you're not really listening to me or anything that they say. You know, you just take a word here, a word there. Some of you just get bored, very tired, very easily. Some of you have attention deficits. I mean, these are all like things you have to deal with in a tiny classroom, which is this. This tiny classroom, David, is what we call social injustice. There is one man, 20 people. You have desires. They're dismissed by me. You have interest, I'm not interested. You want justice? There's only one way, it's my way. I talk about the things I am interested in. If you don't write well, I will make the judgment. You will either be sent to paradise, hell, or purgatory. You have no choice in that. So whenever you deal with a large group of people, it's always going to be unfair for someone, always. I'll give you even a different example. Ask the person next to you. She has two kids. Now, she may not say yes, but it's very, very true what I'm going to tell you. She treats her first child very differently than the second one. The first child 
had 100% of our attention. He had intimacy. The second child, well, first, she feels bad for taking time away from the first one. Then she has to feel guilty for not being with the second one the way she was with the first one. I'm not talking about society. I'm talking about a mother or a father. Injustice is the definition of life. Live with it. You must be very disappointed that our class is coming to an end. <laughs> Do you have any uh, questions or comments before we go? They have to be kind of quickies, short, superficial. You know your assignment is due. Yes, Rebecca? It was probably what you're about to say. Assignment? Yeah. This um, Sunday before midnight. Canvas, yeah, just submit through Canvas. Uh, when you email me your assignment, there's a good chance that it'll just be delayed for like seven months for me to get to it. Listen, do the best you can with these assignments. I can't expect you to write above your capacity. If you can be in a relationship, you can only have flings. And for someone to say, I want to marry you, they're just being dumb. They don't really know what you're all about. If you've been used to writing superficial, cheesy, cheap essays, all I can say is try to give it a little depth. Because you don't have the capacity right now to give it a lot of depth. Just do the best you can. Remember, instructors never grade you. Your own work ultimately grades you. Let me also say one last thing. Listen, my job here is not to offend, to insult, to belittle, to make fun of anyone. I'm just here to share with you some ideas. 99.9% .9 of all the ideas I share with you are enormously complicated. I'm just giving you a tiny little perspective, you know, and I'm quite shallow myself. Don't accept anything that I say. Take it home if you can. Think about it, reflect on it, share with your friends and family, and ultimately trash them. They're not good for you. Have a nice weekend. Stay safe. See you on Tuesday next week.